How many of you think of like the kids that uh, Fourth of July is about? You know, fireworks and steaks. Yeah. Uh, last night in my neighborhood, within probably 100 yards of me, uh, I must have had 50 different neighbors setting off illegal fireworks. Uh, people are really excited about the Fourth of July. Uh, freaking my dog out, but that's another story. Uh, this morning we want to talk about what God has to say to us and to the, His church about leadership. And leadership is one of those weird topics. Uh, some people are drawn to leadership, attracted to leadership, and, and you know they want to be involved in leadership. And other people like run for the hills. Like, would you like a flu shot? No, thank you. You know, and, and go the other way. Uh, how would you like to pay extra taxes? No, thank you. And go the other way. Uh, so there are some people that you know are attracted to, and some people are repelled by leadership. And so I want us to get beyond that this morning. And, and just focus on what God intends here. What is God's intent beyond our human attraction or revulsion to leadership, right? Because let's just be honest, not all people are gifted by God to be leaders. Can we just say amen, right? That's a good thing. There are some that are gifted. Again, let's say Amen. Praise God for men like Billy Graham, right? Praise God for the, the men and women he raises up around the world. I mean, there's another famous woman, Mother Teresa, right? God raised her up in India to serve the poorest of the poor, to make a profound impact on an entire nation of Hindu people for the glory of Jesus Christ. Praise God for her sacrifice and her leadership. Amen. Praise God. We're not all called to that. But what is God's intent? Regardless of you are gifted or you're not gifted, what is God's intent for leaders in his kingdom, in his church? So before we actually get into your notes, I want to read to you just a couple verses from Colossians. And this is Paul talking. And he's talking about how he rejoices in sufferings for your sake and all the work he does for your sake as a leader of the church of Jesus Christ and why he does this. You know, because he's focusing on, on Christ in you, the hope of glory. He, he says this in verse 28, Colossians 1, 28. And we proclaim him, Christ in you, the hope of glory, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom that we may present every man. Now, this is every person, every man, every woman, every child, complete in Christ and for this purpose, I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. That's God's intent. For every leader he raises up in his church around the world to admonish and teach with all wisdom and all power of the Holy Spirit to present every person complete in Christ so that you lack nothing. You ever have an evaluation when you were a kid in school? You get that report card, and some of you look forward to your report cards because you did well in school, and other people did not look forward to those report cards because they struggled, right? And so perhaps you're one of those people that like, Lord, please don't give me my report card today. I don't think I'm ready for my report card just yet. I, I don't think I've got straight A's. I might have a D minus hidden in there somewhere, right? So... What's it going to take for all of us to be complete in Christ? Well, that's a sermon series all into itself. But it's going to take leaders that God appoints. And so when you, when you look at 1 Corinthians 12, 28, God has appointed in the church, first, apostles. These were the men that Jesus himself called, trained, laid his hands on, spent time with day after day after day. He trained them personally. Second, prophets who declared God's word for God's purposes, God's intent, didn't always have anything to do with telling the future, but it had to do with declaring God's word to turn people's hearts towards God. John the Baptist was a prophet. He didn't declare the future, but he turned people's hearts to God. Third, teachers. Apostles, prophets, teachers, leaders in the church. So I want to look at what are the requirements for a leader in the church, a leader for a Christian leader, a leader for a man or woman in Christ. And I've got a, a, a few things here 
seven to be exact, seven critical components of a leader requirements. These are requirements. You can't be a leader in God's church if you're missing one of these. And the first one right off the bat, and, I, and actually I should just ask you, what do you think the highest priority is for any leader in the church? I preached on it last week. It's the greatest commandment. Love. You cannot be an effective leader in the church of Jesus Christ if you have not love. You can have all the most powerful spiritual gifts. You can have every spiritual gift and work miracles more than Peter and Paul did together. But if you don't have love, God has already said, you're nothing but an irritating sound. How would you like that to be on your epitaph? This person's life was summed up as an irritating sound. That'd be the worst, wouldn't it? So God wants us to be known, first of all, by our love. It doesn't matter how much you know if you have no love. You could be the genius of all geniuses. If you have no love, you're worthless. Worthless to God, worthless to people. So love is the greatest commandment. And love in all these verses is what Jesus is talking about. Love is expressed in lots of different ways. Love can be expressed in simply listening. Love can be expressed in simply giving a cup of cold water. But love is always personal. You cannot do love from a distance. You have to touch the other person with your care and your compassion, your understanding, your kindness, your gentleness, all the fruit of the Spirit. You have to give this personally eyeball to eyeball. That's how Jesus ministered, even to lepers, even to the people that nobody else would touch, even to the worst of sinners, Jesus gave this love. So this is where we start. We start with love. Second, compassion. You might think they're the same thing. They're not, because compassion will move your guts to action. Compassion is literally the movement of your guts, your your, your stomach gets tied up in a knot, and you have to do something. You cannot just sit back. You have to move into action. And so that's what Jesus told the disciples. I desire compassion. Matthew 9, Matthew 12, Hosea 6, God says this time and time again. I don't want your religious offerings apart from your compassion. Compassion for the hurting and the needy. Compassion for the broken. Compassion for the fatherless and the widows. Compassion is what moves God. Compassion is what should move us. And then the third requirement for any leader in Jesus' church, if you're going to do any work in Jesus' name, you have to deny yourself. Mark 8, Matthew 10, Philippians 3, Acts 20. This is huge. And this is something that I see less and less of as, as this world gets older. I'm seeing less and less of this. It's not that God has fewer leaders. God keeps appointing leaders. But we keep, keep, in this country in particular, we keep getting tripped up by our egos and our pride. And we want to become famous and we want to write all the best-selling books and, you know, fly around the world and apply private jets and be invited to be speakers hither and yon. And God says, Please just deny yourself first. Jesus literally commanded this. Jesus taught this constantly. He said, look, unless you become like the kernel of grain, the, the kernel of corn that dies and then sprouts, you're nothing. You have to die to self. You have to deny yourself in order to bear fruit for the kingdom of God. It cannot be your way. It has to be Christ's way. Whose church is it? It's Christ's church. So if you're going to serve in any capacity, if you're going to be a leader in any way, if you're leading in worship or you're leading in children or you're leading in any ministry at all, and there's really only five core ministries in any church anywhere in the world. There's the ministry of the word, the ministry of worship and prayer, the ministry of service, the ministry of fellowship, and the ministry of evangelism. Those five core ministries are the church. They are our life in Christ. And so if you're going to lead in any one of those areas, you have to deny yourself first and put others first, exactly the way Jesus did. Is that what the world teaches us? 
No. From the time you're going into public school, they're teaching you to put yourself first. As a matter of fact, you're expecting to get a trophy if you just show up. We're going to honor you just for showing up. The Participation Award. <laughs> God wants you to live your life exactly the way Christ did. He denied himself to save you. And he wants us to deny ourselves to save our neighbors, to save South Sacramento. South Sacramento is important to Jesus Christ, far more important than we realize. And our neighbors, and even the ones we don't know, Jesus died on the cross for. And he wants us, he literally does command us to deny ourselves to reach them for Jesus. That's what it's going to take. And then after you deny yourself, you're not done yet. You get to them, pick up your cross and follow Jesus daily. Pick up your cross daily and follow Jesus. And in the, the spiritual reading God's been giving me in the last few weeks, I've been amazed at the depth of my lack of understanding of picking up my cross and following Jesus. I learned something. Can you imagine that? I learned that you can have internal crosses and external crosses. External crosses can be things like having a neighbor that sets off illegal fireworks in the middle of the night and waking you up and, you know, scaring your dog and, you know, all those kind of things that are irritations and, you know, pains and frustrations. But the internal crosses can actually be harder to bear. Think of how hard it is for a drug addict or an alcoholic with that desire that is in them 24 hours a day even if there's not a drop of alcohol in their house, right? The desire is there. And they're at work, and they're working hard, and they're sober, but the de desire is there. And everywhere go they go, that addiction is in them, prompting them, egging them on, enticing them to do something they know will bring death. That's an internal cross. Pick up your cross and follow Jesus. Don't give in to your sin, whatever it is. You may not be an addict. You may not be an alcoholic, but you've got a sin nature. You've got desires and thoughts within you that are evil. I love you. I, I'm, not, I'm not telling you, oh, you horrible sinner. You shouldn't even show your face in here. No, it's not what I'm saying. Uh, thank God you do show your face in here, right? We are all horrible sinners, and we all need the grace and mercy of God a billion times a day. But you do have. And you don't have to admit it. You don't have to raise your hand. Yes, I do. Yeah, okay, this is between you and God. You've got thoughts. You've got feelings that do not honor God. Can we just admit that? A few months ago, or actually just about a month ago, I read a new article, Neurological Research, that says, and they're studying this constantly, that the average person in the United States thinks 85,000 negative thoughts a day. I know. Now, a thought is like just a microsecond, boom. Your thoughts, you know, they're always in your head. There's a million things going on in your head, even at this moment. You, your eyes might be looking at me, but your brain can be somewhere else entirely. I know that. It's okay. But in all these things going on inside of us, you and I both know not every thought, not every feeling glorifies Jesus. So how do we live with this? We pick up our cross, internal and external, and by faith we follow Jesus. No matter how difficult or how frustrating that internal cross can be, we trust his cross, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and we live in his power of his resurrection. Amen? Amen. So we pick up our cross and we follow Jesus. It's required of every leader. Actually, it's required of anybody that wants to call themselves a disciple of Jesus Christ. So pick up your cross daily. You do not get a vacation from this. Daily you pick up your cross and you follow Jesus. And then the next one I think is even harder for us in America, to have a humble servant's heart. First Thessalonians 2.6, Philippians 2.1-8, 2 
to empty ourselves for the sake of others and to be a servant of all, to empty ourselves and be humble and even wash each other's feet. I thank God that we have this as one of our yearly disciplines as a church, that we have a Monday, Thursday service where we literally do what Jesus did because Jesus at the night of the Last Supper, the, the Passover meal, the night that he was arrested, he washed the disciples' feet. And we practice this here. But we only do it externally once a year. Can you imagine what it would be like if we had this as a lifestyle habit that every time we got together we washed each other's feet? Did we humble ourselves to wash the, the youngest person's feet and the oldest person's feet? If we actually got down on our knees in front of each other to serve, to love, to care. That should be our inner attitude all the time. Now, I do thank God for so many of you. I mean, even yesterday, we had a great crew here working and doing things and, and doing some hard work. We had a church work day yesterday. There was a great crew here working hard. Thank you. Praise God for you. But we, all of us, need to have this attitude of serving Christ and serving each other with humility. That we don't put ourselves first. We put ourselves last have the attitude of a servant, humble servant's heart. That is required of any leader. We don't seek to have the limelight. We don't seek to be famous. We seek to stand in the back and let the church, let the Jesus Christ receive the glory. And then, I think this might be uh, one of those requirements that we look at and we go, how is this even possible? But it is possible. Jesus wants us to put on his character, the character of, of Christ Jesus. And so I want us to turn to 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. It's a trustworthy statement if any man aspires to the office of overseer, a leader in the church, it is a fine work he desires to do. An overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, that is, he's faithful, temperate, he's not a drunk, Prudent, he has wisdom. He's respectable in all his relationships. He's hospitable. He gives compassion to strangers. Able to teach. Not addicted to wine or pugnacious. That is, he's not fighting with people all the time. But gentle, uncontentious. That is, he's not argumentative. And free from the love of money. He must be one who manages his own household well keeping his children under control with dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? He should not be a new convert, lest he become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. The devil's fall was through his own pride. And we must, he must have a good reputation with those outside the church. Who are we here to reach? We're here to reach non-believers. You have to have a good re reputation with non-believers to reach them for Jesus Christ so that he may not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. And then you have the requirements of the deacons, and they're the same. You have to have the character of Christ to lead in Christ's church. Kind of a high bar set there, isn't it? They're like, well, I can't measure up to Jesus. You can in the Spirit of God. You can when you pick up your own cross. When you, you can when you humble yourself. You can when you love. You can, because he's given us the freedom and the power to do so. He calls us. He gives us the spiritual gifts. He enables us to do this work. All of us can do this in Jesus Christ, in the Holy Spirit. Amen. And then John 21. Jesus' command is to shepherd Jesus' flock. The pastor is not here to shear the sheep I'm not here to you know beg you to give me you know 30 million dollars so I can buy myself a private jet so I can fly around the world that's not the purpose of a leader of God's church I'm here to tend the flock feed the flock guard the flock help the flock prosper help the flock be healthy right Amen. that's what Jesus told Peter and that's what all the leaders in the church do. All godly leaders guard the flock, feed the flock, tend the flock, so the flock can reproduce. It's not the shepherd's job to reproduce. You know that, don't you? It's the sheep's job to reproduce. So if you're healthy, if you're well-fed, you're going to reproduce. 
That's what God intends. So let's serve Jesus. Let's love Jesus and each other. Let's humble ourselves, pick up our crosses daily, follow him, and see what he can do. And then what we teach, what we speak, is the word of God like Jesus. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. Look at verses 8 through 11. 1 Peter 4, 8 through 11. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another. There's that first requirement. Because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. As each has received a special gift, employ it, serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks... Let him speak, as it were, the utterances of God. I am not up here to teach you the newest leadership principles in Barnes & Noble's bookstore. I'm not here to teach you the new best-selling philosophies. I'm here to teach you what God has spoken. That's it. That actually makes my job a whole lot easier. Because God has said it. All I have to do is deliver that. Hopefully I deliver it to you in a way that you can hear and appreciate and grow in. But it's God's word. It's not Pastor Steve's word. It's God's word. I speak the utterances of God. I'm sharing you with you what God wants to share, what God has spoken, what God has actually given us in writing for all of us to grow in, me included. Amen. So that is what we're here for, to grow in the Word of God. The Word of God is here to actually penetrate even into the division of your joints and your bones and your marrow. God wants His living Word to get into you so powerfully that it's part of your skeleton. You can't live without your skeleton. What do you think you'd be like right now if your skeleton just disappeared and you had nothing but muscle and fat left? Would you just, you'd be a blob on the floor. God wants us to live and move and have our being, be able to serve and be, be productive by having strong bones, by having his word in us to give us strength. It's his word that gives us life. And then in all these things, in love and compassion and denying self, carrying our cross, having a humble heart, having and building the character of Christ, because we can all build this in our lives, can't we? A little more honesty, a little more integrity, a little more faithfulness. All the character of Christ, all the virtues of Christ we can grow in. Taking care of the flock of Jesus Christ we can all grow in. Speaking the word of God we can all grow in. And then to persevere in difficulties and in sufferings. You'll notice on your outline that point three has the most scripture. There's a reason I gave you a whole lot more scripture on that last point. Because we're here to run a marathon, not a sprint. We're not here for an hour. We're here for a lifetime and an eternity with Christ. We are to persevere forever. That's a long time. How many of you get tired of doing dishes or doing laundry? or mowing the yard, or cleaning the chicken coop, or, you know, all the chores we have to do, right? There's an endless amount of chores. Taking care of the vehicles you've got, you know. I, I, went, I made four trips to Les Schwab, actually five trips. I made five trips to Les Schwab in the last two weeks trying to get one tire repaired because every time I went, they didn't have time to fix it. I would have had to wait like two hours. I had to keep going back because I still had a screw stuck in the, in the tire. So I had to get it fixed. So there's things in life we get tired of dealing with. Still got to do it. Next, next year is going to roll around, God willing. It'll be 2018. And that date, April 15th, is going to roll around again. Got to pay those taxes again. Right? This stuff just keeps rolling around. Keep doing it. And that's what perseverance is all about in our, in our life of faith in Christ. We keep on keeping on. We keep following Jesus. We keep picking up our cross and following him. We, we keep on serving one another. We keep on living a life of humble service. We keep 
on growing in the virtues of Christ. It does not stop until Christ returns and we're in his presence. Until we're seated at the table with him for the wedding feast. All the work here he's given us continues. We keep on doing everything he's called us to do. We keep on making disciples. We keep on praying. We keep on serving. We keep on growing to maturity and completeness in Christ. It doesn't stop. If you reach your 99th birthday, you do not get to sit back and go, somebody else can blow out the candles, I'm done. <laughs> if God gives you 101 birthdays, you keep on growing in Him. You keep on loving. You keep on serving. It doesn't matter how long God gives us here. We keep on persevering. We keep on picking up our cross daily and following Him. In the midst of difficulties, in the midst of persecutions, there are persecutions going on around the world. In every nation, including our own. Now, you and I don't typically go to bed at night worrying if ISIS is going to knock on our door here. But around the world, there are Christians that know that knock could, could happen in the middle of the night. That they would have to run for their lives. Persecution is real. There are difficulties that are real. Growing in Christ is not meant to be a Disneyland roller coaster ride of fun. Now, are there delights in knowing Jesus? Yes. Are there consolations that the Holy Spirit gives and joys in the Lord that transcend anything of this world? Absolutely. I've been leading, reading the lives of different saints who have been persecuted and, and thrown in prison for years under communism particularly, in Russia and Romania. And one thing they all have in common is that under the most intense and evil torture, things you don't even want to, you don't even want me to tell you what happened to these men in prison. God gave them joy that surpassed anything they ever experienced outside of prison while they were in this blacked out cell in isolation where the only human contact they had were the torturers. Jesus met them there in a powerful, miraculous, joy-filled way. And they could not explain that. After they were released from prison, they could not explain why they had so much joy from time to time. Not constantly. They were not in joyful rapture every time they were tortured. They were screaming in agony when they were tortured. But afterward, Jesus met them and blessed them. And so we persevere in pain, in difficulties, in persecutions, in frustrations, in loneliness, in shipwrecks, in beatings, in all these different things that happened to the Apostle Paul, all the other apostles, including John, who was put on the Isle of Patmos by the Romans so that he would die. They didn't put him on the Isle of Patmos so could he could enjoy a, you know, a day on the beach. They put him there and left him there to die. But God saved him. Gave us the book of Revelation. Even in the midst of the worst persecution, God has an intent to bless. Genesis 50, 20. What men meant for evil, God meant for good. So every evil thing we suffer, or can suffer, God will bring good out of it if we'll simply persevere in trusting him. I want to encourage you, even if you do not consider yourself to be a leader in the church, to look at this list and see how you can grow. Can you grow in the character of Christ? Can you grow in love? Can you grow in compassion? Is there anything on this list that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you saying, I really want you to take a step with me here and grow in Christ. Be a blessing to the church. Be a blessing to our neighbors in Sacramento that need Jesus. We're meant to be his light here for all the dark places, for all the scary things going on. We're meant to be his light that casts away the darkness. And we're here to make disciples, amen? So let's get busy.
picking up our cross, denying ourselves, and following Jesus in all the ways he leads us. Amen?